quite a lecture tonight. Uh, we have tonight Michael Deutsch, who is an attorney from Chicago, Illinois. He represents the People's Law Office in Chicago. Michael is a graduate of Northwestern Law School. He has been an activist and a civil rights attorney for over 20 years. Um, amongst some of the cases Michael's worked on is in 1969 with, uh, when Fred Hampton and Mark Clark of the Illinois Black Panther Party were murdered by the Chicago police and the infamous Red Squad of the state's attorney's office in Illinois. Um, it was Michael and, and other attorneys at the People's Law Office who uh, represented Hampton and Clark's families and they fought for 15 years to win a lawsuit for the families and survivors of the Chicago police murders of Mark Clark and Fred Hampton. They eventually, in 19, um, was it 85? 83. In 1983, they won a lawsuit totaling nearly $2 million as compensation to the victims of the Chicago police. Um, the People's Law Office in Chicago represent um, numerous people on civil rights cases, people that have been victimized and murdered by the state, be it the FBI, the local police, or the state police. Um, they're presently fighting a federal civil rights suit in the federal district court in Buffalo, New York, representing the victims and the survivors and the families of the people that were murdered at Attica Penitentiary. Today is the anniversary, September 9th, 1991, is the 20-year anniversary of the murder at Attica, where prison guards and New York State troopers came in and murdered not only prisoners, but murdered 10 hostages, 10 guards. The objectives of the suit that they are pursuing in federal district court is to collect compensation for the victims of the inmates and the families of the prisoners that were both murdered and beaten and tortured by New York State troopers and New York State prison guards. They've been fighting this case now for 20 years. Michael's here tonight to tell you about that court case but even more importantly, he's here to tell you the true story of what happened at Attica on September 9th, 1971, and to tell you it the way the prisoners saw it. So without any further ado, let me introduce Michael Deutsch. Um, today, September 9th, is the day that the prisoners started to riot and ultimately rebelled at Attica. September 13th, Friday, four days later, is when the state police stormed Attica prison. So we are celebrating not only the 20-year anniversary of the rebellion in Attica, but we're commemorating the tremendous, terrible slaughter that occurred on September 13th. What happened in Attica was the worst slaughter and mass brutality inflicted by government authorities on unarmed U.S. civilians in the history of this country. You cannot think of any other circumstance other than attacks by U.S. military on Native American people where more people were killed and injured uh, by force by, authorized by the state. Twenty-nine prisoners were killed at Attica. Ten guards and civilians who worked for the state of New York were killed, all by state bullets, either by the state police who were authorized and ordered by then-Governor Nelson Rockefeller to go into Attica, 
and by correctional officers who were forbidden to go into Attica and yet went in anyway, carrying their own weapons and firing at will. In addition to the 39 people that were killed in that onslaught, over 85 prisoners were seriously wounded by bullets, and hundreds of prisoners were systematically beaten and tortured after the prison was taken and after the prisoners were totally subdued. In order to really understand why Attica happened and the circumstances of Attica, I, I suspect at least half of you in here weren't even alive when, in 1971. Uh, it's important to understand what was going on in New York State prison system back then, and in fact, uh, what was going on at Attica. At Attica, you had a prison population that was 70% black and Puerto Rican, yet every prison guard at Attica was white. The majority of the prisoners came from urban areas, either New York City or the Buffalo area, and the entire prison guard population came from rural upstate New York. You had a total lack of communication between guards and prisoners. The prisoners lived under conditions which were intolerable. They were forced to work for 20 cents a day under, in the metal shop or in the laundry, in uh, incredibly uh, hard jobs, dirty jobs, uh, very hot working conditions yet they were allowed to only shower one day a week, even though they worked under these conditions. They were forced to march to and from the mess hall. Their meals consisted of mostly pork. Many of the prisoners at Attica were Muslims, who didn't, was against their religious teaching to, to eat pork. Uh, many of the prisoners, at least 20% uh, of the prisoners were Latin, mostly Puerto Rican yet they had no Spanish-speaking guards. The prisoners were not even allowed to uh, correspond with their family in Spanish, even though their, their families only spoke Spanish. There were no books in the library in Spanish. Uh, there was a total lack of any type of recognition that there was a population that was diverse um, and needed special um, attention. The medical care at Attica was intolerable. The doctors, they had two doctors at Attica, at Attica who refused to, to treat many prisoners. They used to examine prisoners through a metal, through a, a, a mesh screen. They wouldn't even let a prisoner sit in a room with them. They had to have a screen between the prisoner and themselves. There was no religious freedom. Uh, prisoners could not, particularly Muslim prisoners, could not practice their religion. There were, uh, prisoners were not allowed to receive reading material of their choice. There was a, a censor who said at one point, any, any books about science, psychology, uh, I'm going to keep out because we don't want prisoners thinking about psychology or science while they're in prison. Um, there was no educational opportunity for the prisoners. Um, there was no grievance procedure. Um, there was no uh, legal assistance for prisoners. Essentially, you had a situation in, which is not that different than today in many prisons. Uh, it was more pronounced at Attica 20 years ago. But you had prisoners that were basically warehoused there and spent most of their time in their cells with nothing to do. And you also had a very politically conscious prison population. Many of the prisoners had been uh, come out of the 1960s, the movements of the 60s, uh, they had, if not part of those movements, had learned about those movements. They identified with those movements. Uh, they felt that they were being oppressed because of their, their race or because of their economic status. Uh, they had in Attica a chapter of the Black Panther Party at that time. They had a chapter of the Young Lords Party, which was a Puerto Rican liberation group. And they had many black Muslims in Attica who had gotten some strength and some clarity about their own status by following the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. The Muslim prisoners were very disciplined. They didn't smoke. They didn't drink. Uh, they were very well behaved and very militant. And you had this situation where you had rising consciousness of prisoners under intolerable conditions and being held and confined by racist guards who had no conception of who they were dealing with. And there had been a whole process of trying to get these grievances 
basic human rights grievances, less pork in the food, more educational opportunities, higher pay, minimum wage, uh, no censorship, allowing the prisoners to be politically active, just basic human rights. And there have been efforts by the prisoners to petition peacefully to get some kind of change in their conditions. And each time they would write a letter and each time they would ask to meet with the warden or the commissioner of corrections, they were told, be patient. Things will change. These things take time. And on the September 9th, 20 years ago, there was a riot that happened at Attica. It was not planned. Uh, it, was not, it was nothing that was uh, intentionally caused other than by the conditions themselves. But as, as the riot occurred, and essentially it began, it began between a, fight, a fight between a guard and a prisoner, and then some other prisoners got involved, and before you knew it, a whole section of the prison was involved in this fight. And then in Attica, the prison was divided into four separate parts. If you lived in one part of the prison, even if your brother lived in another part, you could not see him. Only one day a year could you ever see him. They had divided the prison into four separate prisons. And in that day in Attica, the Times Square gate, which separated the prisoners in those four prisons, broke. And those prison, prisoners were able to run and meet each other. And 1,200, almost 1,300 prisoners streamed into DR in Attica. And as they, as they rioted into DR, they grabbed 40 hostages, mostly guards, some civilians. And they, and they were, found themselves in this huge area, uh, in control of the prison, in that area of the prison, uh, not really knowing what to do next with these hostages, with a lot of people who had anger towards the guards, with the idea of venting their frustration. And in the initial period when the riot first happened, some guards were injured. And in fact, one guard was injured and ultimately died as a result of his injuries. And there was a very tense and troubling situation. White prisoners were scared. What was going to happen? Was this going to be a race riot? Um, was there going to be uh, more vengeance taken out on the hostages? And what happened then turned the riot of Attica into a political rebellion. Because what happened was is that some of the more politically conscious prisoners, some who belonged to various groups that had been espousing change in the prison, got together. And they said, we have to do something here to let the world know that this is not a riot of animals, but this is a rebellion of prisoners who are trying to seek better conditions for themselves. And they elected representatives, spokesmen, white people, black people, Puerto Rican people. And the first thing they did was they said, we have to protect these hostages and make sure that nobody does them any harm. And the black Muslim prisoners were selected to guard the hostages at Attica, and they formed a circle around them, and all the hostages were put in that circle. And then they set up a table, and they made a call, a public call. They said that they wanted people to come, observers, uh, prison rights advocates, elective, elected officials, newsmen, to come to D Yard and listen to their grievances and hear them. And as a result of that public call, many people came as observers. Tom Wicker came from the New York Times, congressman from the Bronx, Herman Badillo came, the publisher of a black newspaper, the Amsterdam News came, various state legislators, Arthur Eve, who was a black legislator from Buffalo, William Kunstler, a well-known civil rights activist. About 40 different people came, as well as news people, and they came to hear the inmates' grievances and to help somehow peaceably resolve this issue. And at the same time, the state of New York realized that they had to begin to listen to the inmates at Attica, and they began a process of negotiations. And the then head of the uh, corrections, a man by the name of Russell Oswald, went into D Yard and sat at the table and began to negotiate with the prisoners about their, the issues that they felt were just grievances. And this was all being filmed to the world. The world was seeing on television what was happening in Attica and what really the prisoners were after there. And this went on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. During that time, the prisoners had to create a society 
that was going to take care of 1,200 people in DR. They had to protect the hostages. They had to feed 1,200 prisoners and 40 hostages. They had to make sure that they had places to sleep. They had to make sure that there was a way to protect people from other people. So they set up a security system where several of the uh, inmates were in charge, and they made sure that there was no assaults by prisoners on other prisoners, no homosexual attacks in any way, no drug use. They set up rules. They made sure that the hostages were the first ones fed, and they, and they got mattresses for the hostages, and they made sure that they were covered at night. They set up a, an actual society in DR, and the world could see that. And despite the fact that there was a lot of anger and frustration, during that four days there was no hostage that was harmed. Every hostage was protected, and they basically ran a society there uh, in DR, and the negotiations went on. And what happened was at some point the state of New York decided that they didn't want to negotiate anymore. They wanted to take back Attica prison. And when it became clear that they were going to do that, they had amassed over 500 state police armed with riot shotguns and high-powered rifles. Correctional guards, guards at the prison, were all brought their own personal weapons and were surrounding the prison. Sheriff's police from all over the area came to Attica. Park police came to Attica. And they were, had been waiting outside Attica for four days, chomping at the bit to go in and retake the prison. And as they waited, these rumors were circulating among the force that there had been atrocities committed against the hostages that a hostage had, hostage had been emasculated, that hostages had been killed. And, pe and those in authority knew that those, those rumors were false because they were people going in and out and they could see the hostages, yet they took no steps to try and dispel those rumors. There was the, the assault force, which made up of over 500 armed state officials, were all white. And basically there was a lot of talk about we're going to get us a nigger, we're going to get us a white nigger. We're going to get us a Puerto Rican nigger. They were making racial taunts at the observers when they went in and out to help the prisoners negotiate. Even the commissioner of corrections who was going in there was being vilified by the people outside, the armed police, because of the fact that he was trying to settle the thing peaceably. And when it became clear that there was going to be some kind of terrible massacre brewing here, some of the leaders of the hostages, Tom Wicker, a man by the name of Herman Badil, who was a U.S. congressman at that time, a man by the name of John Dunn, who is now the head of the Justice Department Civil Rights Division, got on the phone and called Nelson Rockefeller and begged him to come to Attica to talk to the prisoners, not even to go into D. Yard, but to show the prisoners that he was serious about implementing these demands that they had asked for. And essentially, almost all the demands the state of New York said they would accede to. They said it takes time, thing, we'll try to work it out. The one demand that they wouldn't accede to was amnesty for the prisoners. And there was no way that the state of New York said that they were going to give amnesty to these prisoners, that they were going to seek to prosecute the prisoners for their role in the riot. And since this man, Quinn, had died after injuries received in the early seconds of the riot, the prisoners feared that they were all going to be uh, prosecuted for murder and could face the death penalty. So there was an impasse at Attica, and there was a need for the governor to come and try to ameliorate the situation. But Rockefeller refused to come, and Badillo told him on the phone, if you don't come, there's going to be a massacre here, and the blood is going to be on your hands. And he was set to send the, the, the guard and state police troop in on Sunday. And Badillo told him, if this comes out on the news on Sunday when everybody's home watching the football games, you're going to have riots in the black and Puerto Rican communities of this country. And Rockefeller said, well, I'm getting a lot of pressure, political pressure, to stop this, this rebellion that the politics that are being espoused by the prisoners is revolutionary, it's threatening, and I have no choice but to send in this armed force. But I'll wait 
I won't send them in on Sunday because you're right. If I send them in where, while everybody's home watching television, I'll have a problem. I'll wait. And he waited to the following Monday morning. And on Monday morning, about 9.45, a, a National Guard helicopter flew over DR at Attica and dropped powerful CS gas onto the prisoners. At the same time, they dropped loads of CS gas onto the prisoners. They were saying, surrender, put up your hands and you will not be harmed. And while they were doing that, 300 heavily armed state police and correctional guards marched into Attica with their guns blazing. They had no plan. They had no strategy. If they were going to try and save the hostages, it would have been impossible if there was going to be any intentional harm to the hostages because the hostages were at least two to three minutes away from any charge in state police. The state police used shotguns with double-O buck, which has eight to 12 pellets in each gun, which sprays. At 50 yards, it sprays four to six feet. They fired over 3,000 rounds of ammunition in an area a little bit bigger than this room where 1,200 people were. In addition to that, the, the, uh, the state police had uh, dum-dum bullets in their rifles, which is outlawed by the Geneva Convention. These are bullets that enter and expand, and they're used for deer hunting in many cases. And, and these are the type of weaponry they use, dum-dum bullets and double-O buck. And they fired and shot and killed. They killed people with their hands in the air. They killed people who were hiding in, in tents. They killed people who were, were surrendering, who, people who were crawling on the ground. They killed people who were begging for their life. And they killed, in cold blood, 10 of their own people. They, were, they went in with such a frenzy, with, without any type of strategy or plan, against unarmed prisoners. Not one prisoner had a gun at Attica. They had spears, they had, they had bats, but no one had a gun. And they fired 3,000 rounds of ammunition for eight minutes against unarmed prisoners. And when the smoke cleared, there was 39 people dead and 85 people seriously wounded. But that's not the end of the story of Attica. Because when they came into Attica, they had 32 ambulances waiting outside the gate. And they rushed in and they took each hostage, whether they were shot or not. Ten had been killed, several others had been shot, others had not. And they put them in an ambulance and they whisked them away to the emergency room of the local hospital. There wasn't medical attention for these prisoners from 9.45 until the first operations began at 2 o'clock. Prisoners who were shot, many of them bled to death. Many of them didn't get medical attention for five, six, seven hours. Many of them didn't even get medical attention until the following day. No provisions were made for the medical needs of the prisoners. The National Guard Medical Unit, who was allegedly supposed to take care of the prisoners, was a half hour away from Attica when the shooting stopped. And by the time they got into D yard, they were astonished. They had no idea they were going to use such force. They had no idea that they, there was going to be that need. There was no plasma at Attica. They had shut off the water in the hospital. There was no water. There was no surgical supplies there. There was nothing. They couldn't, as I say, do an operation until 2 o'clock that day. And then prisoners were so badly injured that they had to be taken out of the prison and the warden refused to allow the prisoners to be taken out to a, a regular hospital. The first prisoner arrived at an outside hospital at 5.30 that evening. 9.45, the assault was over. The first prisoner arrived at the hospital at 9.45. They also stripped all the prisoners, and they set up a systematic strategy of brutality and torture. They took the people who they felt were the leaders, the negotiators, and they put X's on their back and they isolated them. And they systematically tortured them for several hours. One, one man who was the leader of the security force was put on a table, nude. A football was put under his chin. And he was told if he dropped that football, they'd kill him. And then they proceeded 
to put cigars and cigarettes out on his body, to take shot, hot shotgun shells and put it on his body, to take gun butts and smash them in the testicles repeatedly. For four hours he laid on that table. Other people were tortured similarly. There are many stories, gruesome stories, about what happened. And this was all witnessed by the National Guard who came into Attica about a half hour to 45 minutes later and testified about incredible acts of brutality and bestiality that was uh, carried out against these subdued, nude prisoners. And this, this type of activity, this mass torture, didn't just go on for that day. It went into the night. It went into the next day and into the day after that. And while all this was going on, the Commissioner of Corrections and the Warden of Attica was sitting in a room, locked in a room, saying, I, didn't know, I don't know anything about what happened. I didn't know this was going to happen. In fact, they knew the state of mind of the correctional officers was so unstable that the governor himself had given an order that no correctional officer should take take part in the subduing the prisoners, after, go in to retake the prison. That order was never communicated by the higher-ups. And in fact, many correctional officers went into Attica prison with their own personal weapons. And the evidence shows that several of them killed, their, their bullets were found in, in dead prisoners. Several prisoners were executed after all the shooting stopped. And there's evidence that supports that as well. The prisoners who were considered to be the leaders of Attica, uh, those who were the negotiators, those who were the spokespeople, were put in a special housing isolation unit and kept there for eight months. Denied basic amenities, uh, at first denied access to lawyers, denied medical care. One prisoner lost his leg from gang green because he didn't get medical treatment, because he lied in HBZ for, for two weeks, and then they had to take off his leg. Another prisoner had five bullet wounds in his body and didn't get medical attention for a week. And this was done with the sanction of the governor of the state of New York, with the head of the Department of Corrections, with the warden, and carried out by the head of the state police force who led the attack and planned the attack. They had no plan about saving lives at Attica. They had no communication, no way to communicate with each other. The, 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 uh, because of all the gas, the gas was sufficient alone to put prisoners on the ground. Not one f shot was necessary to be fired there. But once the gas was unleashed, the guards who were the stormtroopers couldn't even communicate with each other. There was no way for them to even understand what a prisoner was saying. And they were told, don't let a prisoner approach you or take your gun. If some, a prisoner approaches you, you fire, protect your gun. And each individual state police officer was told, use your own discretion as when to fire your gun. There was no ceasefire order. There was no fire order. Every man in there was given the power to decide over the life and death of the prisoners. And after they did this incredible thing, they then told the world the story that the hostages had died because their throats were slit. And I don't know if any of you remember this, but to this day, I would say at least 60% of the people who know about Attica still think that the hostages died because the prisoners slit their throat. Even after the autopsies were done, and it was shown conclusively that every hostage died from a bullet wound by a state gun. They went and tried to get another pathologist to give another report, saying the pathologist that gave the report must be a communist, because he, he said this, that it could not be possible. And they told the world repeatedly that hostages' throats had been slit, and that's how they died. And they also told the world that Guard, that guards had been tortured and emasculated. And there was no evidence that any guard had been abused in any way other than in the initial riot of the first minutes of, the, of the, uh, September 9th. Now, the, the other thing they did immediately was try to cover up the crimes of the state. 
They had no accountability. No one who had a rifle or a shotgun signed out. Usually when you have a shotgun or a rifle, you have to sign your name so they know what gun belongs to what person. They didn't do that at Attica. They didn't film parts of the assault. They did not have any accountability for the uh, bullets that were used. So, so there was no way of knowing how many bullets somebody took. They took all the physical evidence that was found in the yard and they destroyed it. They had the state police investigators assigned to investigate what happened at Attica. The same state police that went in and shot the people were now in charge of investigating what crimes took place at Attica. And not unsurprisingly, there was a grand jury investigation carried out to find out what happened at Attica and what crimes were committed. And after eight months of giving evidence by the state to a grand jury, 60 indictments were returned at Attica, all against prisoners. Not one state official, not one guard, not one state police was charged with any criminal activity. Not for the shooting, not for the beating, not for the denial of medical care. The only people that were indicted were prisoners for kidnapping and being involved in the riot. And these prisoners, 60 of them, faced 1,500 counts of felonies. Most of them were looking at life imprisonment for this. And this was supposed to be an impartial inquiry into what happened at Attica. That's basically when I got involved in the Attica situation. I came there in October of 71, uh, right after the, the rebellion was subdued. When I came, this was three weeks afterwards, there were still prisoners with bullets that had not had medical attention. There were prisoners that were badly in need of, of medical attention. There were prisoners that had no access. They had not even told their families. One of the things that the prison did was immediately notify the hostages' families about their death, but didn't bother to notify the prisoners' families until weeks later. Families didn't know that their loved ones had been killed. There was no information being uh, let out of Attica. And what we tried to do was organize a defense to these charges and to try and bring the true story of Attica, at least in defense of people who were charged with crimes. Because the real criminals at Attica were the, were the state officials. And more, even more so than those who, sh who fired the weapons and those who did the actual brutality. It was those in, in, in authority. Because as, as Herman Badillo said, and Tom Wicker wrote a book with the title, What Was the Hurry? What was the rush? There's always time to die. Why couldn't they continue to negotiate? Why did they have to go in with that type of force when they knew that the assault force state of mind was such that there was going to be a massacre? And they told Rockefeller there was going to be a massacre. And they told them that they shouldn't let the correctional guards go in there. And yet they went ahead and did it anyway. And the reason they did it was they wanted to make a statement to the world. And Oswald, who was the commissioner of corrections, came out of, of the prison that morning and said, we cannot tolerate this type of political activity. We will not allow prisoners to rebel in our society. And it was mostly because these prisoners were not only rebelling, but they were saying things to the world about their conditions. And they were asking for humane treatment. And they had to be crushed and they had to be suppressed. And the state of New York, through Governor Rockefeller and the, and the higher-ups, were committed to doing that. Now, as a result of the criminal cases, the, the, the prosecutions were so one-sided and the, it were so unfair that ultimately the new governor of the state of New York, a man by the name of uh, Hugh Carey, had to give amnesty to all the prisoners. Only one prisoner was ever convicted, and he was given amnesty from a prison cell. All the other cases were dropped because they wanted to close the book on Attica. They wanted to say, well, it wasn't a fair investigation. The crimes of the state were not really investigated. So let's close the book, because we don't want to look into what, really, what real crimes the state committed at Attica. And in fact, there was a man by the name of Malcolm Bell, was a very straight, 
prosecutor, Harvard Law School, answered an ad in the paper saying for a prosecutor, and he joined the Attica prosecution. And as he worked on the Attica prosecution, he was led to believe that he was going to be in charge of investigating the crimes of the state officials and state police for murder and other crimes. And he started to investigate it and started to gather evidence. And as he was ready to present evidence to the grand jury, they told him, forget it, Malcolm. We're not going to do that anymore. It's, it's, it's not, it's not uh, effective anymore. This is at the very time that Nelson Rockefeller had been nominated to be vice president of the United States. And they didn't want to do anything that was going to embarrass Nelson Rockefeller. Malcolm Bell left, and he denounced the Attica investigation. He wrote a book called The Turkey Shoot, where he spells out how this whole massacre occurred and how it was covered up in the investigation. And as a result of that, there was an investigation of the investigation. And that's why they had to dismiss the criminal cases and close the books on Attica. But we don't think the books should be closed on Attica because we think that people died and suffered immeasurably unnecessarily and that we think the real story of Attica must be told. And not only because the prisoners and their families should be compensated for the injuries they suffered and the loss of their loved ones, but also because people who allow such type of official brutality and violence, people who are in power and authority in this country or in any country, are supposed to be held, held accountable, even if it's 20 years later. Just like they go and find those Nazi war criminals 20 and 30 years later and prosecute them. Just like they look for the generals in Argentina and Chile and make them responsible. Those people who use state power in that way have to be made accountable. Otherwise, it'll happen again. It might not happen in a prison. It might happen in a community. It might happen somewhere else. And we have a responsibility, all of us, to make sure that there are no more Atticas and Attica doesn't occur again. And that's the burden that we've taken on in this lawsuit. We represent the 1,200-odd prisoners that were in DR on that day. And what we're saying is that the state of New York, through the, through the head of the state police, we are just suing the supervisors. We're not suing the people who actually shot. We're suing the head of the state police who planned the assault, who knew that there was no way to stop this type of wanton infliction of harm, who had no strategy, no way of communication, who left all the discretion whether to fire or not to the individual state policeman. And we're saying he's guilty of using excessive force under the civil rights law and that he should be held accountable. He's dead. We're saying his estate should be held accountable. And we're saying that once his estate is held accountable, the state of New York is going to have to pay whatever damages the jury finds. And we're saying that Russell Oswald, who was the head of the Commissioner of Corrections, who knew that they were going to go in with that firepower that they had and knew that people were going to be killed, ignored the medical needs of the prisoners, just didn't care about them. And we're saying he's responsible for not planning for the medical needs of the prisoners. And we're saying that the warden of Attica and Oswald and the deputy warden are responsible for not stopping that systematic brutality and torture that went on. They had prisoners naked with glass all over the ground running through gauntlets of uh, guards with clubs. And as they'd go through these long gauntlets, which were maybe 30, 40 feet long, on each side a guard with a long club or axe handle, and they would be whacked across the back of the head or across the, the uh, waist or on the leg. So that 10 days after this, a, a panel of independent doctors came into Attica and found that at least 50% of the prisoners they looked at had bruises all over their body as a result of this. Ten days afterwards, that was the force and the ferocity, ferocity that they used against, against them in doing this. And of course, the ones that were singled out were tortured systematically for over a period of days. Those people are responsible for that. And basically, our lawsuit 
is to try and tell this story as fully and as completely as we can uh, to the people, to the public, to the jury, so that we can close the books on Attica, but close them in a way that there's some modicum of justice for those people. You can't get back the 39 people that died. You know, the 10, the 10 people that worked for the state of New York, they worked for the state of New York. They were either guards or civilian employees. They were shot down. They, they, were, they weren't rioting prisoners. They worked for the state of New York. They were shot down, and the state of New York refused to give them anything but workman's compensation. When they went and they were told, file for workman's compensation, so they did. And then when they filed for it, they said, oh, that's, too, that's it. You have selected your remedy. You can't go to court. You can't get any type of damage. So they even were willing to sacrifice their own people because what they were trying to do is send a message to the world that we are not going to tolerate this type of activity. We're not going to let prisoners do this. But they didn't do it in a way like this, saying, we think the conditions are bad, we're going to try and change the conditions. They could have gone into that prison with sticks and clubs and gas and subdued that prison and without any loss of life. But they chose to do it another way, and that was an intentional decision. It was a political decision. So that's, in a nutshell, an overview of the story of Attica. I'm sure you, this, what I said, may have engendered a lot of questions, and I'm here to answer questions that you may have about what happened, what's happened to the prisoners. One question that people ask, so I'll answer it right away. There are still about 100 prisoners still in prison 20 years later who were in Attica. Many prisoners have gotten out. Some have gone back in. Many have died, and then there are a whole group of others that have really made it. They have good jobs, they have families, they have tried to put the horror of Attica behind them, and they are productive members of society. But none, no one, not one person that was in D-Yard and saw the way they came in there. The prisoners never believed that the, that the state would come in that way, and the state never believed that the prisoners would not harm the hostages. You had a kind of re reversal here. The state thought, oh, they're going to kill the hostages, so let's just go in there and shoot them down, and if we have to kill some hostages, that's the price we have to pay. And the prisoners thought, well, they'll come in, but they won't come in shooting. They'll come in with sticks and clubs and gas, and, you know, that'll be it. But they underestimated the, ver the, the viciousness of the state and the state underestimated the humanity of the prisoners. And that's a lesson in itself. So I'm open to questions. I don't know how long I spoke. But... Well, the case begins September 30th. It's a very complex and difficult case. You can imagine trying to recre recreate a situation 20 years later. Many of the people who are involved, the witnesses, are dead. Many people don't want to come forward now. Our case consists of several categories of witnesses. The National Guardsmen who came in and saw the brutality occurring in front of them. Many of them were scarred for life for it. We go and see National Guardsmen and they'll break down crying about what they saw. They, they, they compare it to my life. Um, and also they saw that the medical care was there was no medical care for the prisoners. We have doctors who finally were called to the prison and finally were able to set up. And they're saying there was no excuse for this. They knew they were going in. We could have been set up and ready to go immediately. Even if they were going to use all that force, we could have been there ready and saving lives right away. So that's another group. And the prisoners as a group of witnesses, many of them are dead, and the observers. These are the people who came from all over to help the prisoners negotiate a resolution. It's a very difficult case. I don't know if you were sitting on a jury like that and heard this evidence, maybe you'd feel sympathetic and want to give a verdict for the prisoners, but maybe you'd say to yourself, well, they were rioting prisoners. You know, they shouldn't have been rioting in the first place. You know, they got what they deserve. I think some people will feel that way. And I think that those people would not 
give a verdict for a prisoner no matter what, no matter what the evidence. And that's a problem because a lot of the issue is racism, a lot of it is anti-prisoner. Um, there's a lot of fear of crime that's increased since then. And people think prisoners are just as a class not entitled to any type of humane treatment. And that's the problem in terms of trying to try a case to a jury of people, you know, just everyday people.